professor at Purdue University, where she teaches creative writing at undergraduate and graduate levels. Her poetry has been featured on NPR, both on Weekend Edition and on Garrison Keillor's Writer's Almanac. She's the author of three books. Her first book of poems, Red Signature, won the National Poetry Series. Her second volume, The Penultimate Suitor, won the Iowa Prize. Just Out from Shearsman Books in the UK is her latest, Beyond the Fire. A review of her work in the New York Times said, Leader artfully articulates one woman's struggle to unite intellect and emotion. Many of you attended her wonderful reading, her generous reading last night. And this morning we have a formal interview conducted by three of our MFA students, Ruth Bauman, Matt Hellams, Claire Cantrell, all poetry students. They will have formal questions for Professor Leader lasting between 45 minutes and, and an hour, and then we'll have time to take some questions from the floor. Join me in welcoming Mary Leader. Well, Mary, um, first question that I wanted to ask you was, um, about that time in Memphis. You talked for, for several years here, um, and um, could you talk a little bit about maybe how, how this region has influenced your work and possibly how other regions have influenced you? Um, it's probably a short answer because I'm not, I'm not particularly influenced by this region, but rather by the people who are here. Now, I suppose that those are inseparable. If you're if you're from here, but of course most of the people I knew here were not from here, uh, so uh, and I did not take as much advantage as I should have. Get downtown, listen to music, those kinds of things. I lived near campus. I've always been a little bit of a hermit. Uh, I lived on the ninth floor here, which seemed like a metaphor of never quite getting my feet on the ground in Memphis. Uh, but it's the people I remember: certain students, certain colleagues secretaries, uh, who I just uh, saw, Ms. Franklin and, uh, and uh, Susan Fitzgerald in the hall. I had Susan's son, Chris. So it's like family memories. You know, if you're at a family reunion, no one says, well, what do you think of the landscape? Because they take it for granted. But I remember many people from here and many wonderful students and colleagues. Uh, and just the building itself, I thought, I, know, I thought it would all come back to me immediately, but there's been changes. That whole second floor cafe thing? You used to walk into a vast linoleum plane when you came in the second floor. But once I got up here on four, and my office is right over here, uh, then the place starts coming back. But it's, it's localized. It's this place. It's not the town. I couldn't quite remember how to get the campus. The, but the region where I grew up, though, Oklahoma, that, that region is sunk in. Other regions have, I've just been a tourist. Yeah. Well, you have spoken before, I've employed certain strategies in your work, like using found poems, um, needlework, you know, stuff, things that allow for non-traditional narrative structures. So I have two related questions on that. I was wondering, how do you make use of these strategies in the context of narrative? And whether or not you think literal narrative is a necessity? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm interested in the way that a frame can allow me to tell a story, whereas the, the picture that's being framed has been told by somebody else. And so uh, the, most, the most prominent example, the most purely found poem in my work was uh, found in a law case. Uh, and it was a, um, it was a, uh, essentially a suicide note by a young man who was in trouble with the law and uh, had been arrested. And somebody, uh, it was not actually a case that I had because I didn't actually feel it was actually in federal court, but somebody had given it to me. And so I took his language, added a little bit, but mostly it was the frame that I used to, to that, that I made it so that I could use it. So I called it. Coulter's Elegy, because there's a famous poem called Tichborne's Elegy, the only poem by a young man named Cheon Tichborne, 
who was a Catholic in Elizabethan times, which was not a lucky thing to be. And he wrote this one poem, an elegy for himself, an elegy is always in contemplation of death, uh, that began with, you know, my feast of joy is but a dish of pain. And so I used that as an epigraph and titled it after his poem, and then include, and then and then with some alterations, put the boys poem, put the boys language in there. Now, poets would have one question about that. Lawyers had another. I mean, my friend said, okay, well, he'll never, his family will never see it. He won't get sued. <laughs> uh, but I don't, think, I don't think a poet's first question would be, aren't you afraid you're going to get sued? <laughs> but yet, I could be because that's not my language. Who owns that language, the, the, the compositor of it or the framer of it? I mean, do I change it enough by framing it to say it, it belongs in my book. It's theft. And that's only an extreme example of theft. All, you know, all, all poetry is, is theft of a kind. It's all used goods. So, and I, like, I also like uh, for unsigned forms like samplers, for instance, or things that are, um, so although samplers actually, oddly enough, samplers are often signed with the girl's name, the woman's name. Uh, but things like quilts and uh, throws, you know, comforter things. Uh, a, a, hi, John. Uh, uh, so a like a, a flame stitch. Uh, uh, in the language, flame stitch, which is a diagonal kind of a zigzag stitch. Uh, I like to try to emulate something like that to connect me with the people who made unsigned, useful, beautiful things. So it's a kind of a it's a kind of a democratic folk uh, attitude that informs some of that some of that borrowing I like to do. And as for a narrative structure, I I love stories, but I'm not I am not good at telling them. I always go wait I forgot. <laughs> I have no sense of timing, uh, and so um, it's just not something it, I, I I do with a, with my dominant hand. I'm much more pattern-minded than I am narrative-minded. But I admire stories. Uh, but ultimately, it's just uh, not what I'm good at. I, I, like, to, I like to take the, the voices out or, and, and take patterns out of the drift of language and not have them be in a narrative structure that involves a who, what, where, when, Grounding things that, that most most contemporary poetry does have a strong narrative component, but I'm not particularly interested in that. So. In many of your poems, uh, music plays a, a large role. I noticed that there's the one sort of the chromatic scale yeah. that sort of had the end on the, the Bach. Um, uh -huh. That's sort of interesting. Uh, I found it interesting. Uh, sort of how do you employ music in your work? Do you sort of, I mean, you sort of sang some last night, so like, do, you, do you have more poems in which you have melodies sort of associated with things, mm -hmm. or do you sort of think of it almost as songwriting? Um, That's an interesting so. question, too, because a song, you know, is not a story. I mean, there are ballads. There are songs that tell stories. And I'm actually very interested in those because they're, they're also a folk form. They must be memorable, or we wouldn't have them. And that's one definition of a poem, too. People think memorability is important in poetry. But um, poetry is just pleasure for me, and it's pattern. It's, it's, we were saying uh, it, it's math mind. And it's one of the reasons I like uh, forms that, in, that involve uh, rotating components in a recognizable pattern. Uh, so I, you know, I just listen to music and I'm informed by it. I wish I could play it. I wish I had a good singing voice. I don't. But that doesn't stop me. <laughs> and um, one of the things I like to ask students sometimes is, what what song were were you sung as a child as a lullaby? And it's, it wasn't a while it's rock a bye baby, but more often it's something quirky. Can you think of a song that you were that you were sung to as a child? May I have the one? Yes. <laughs> That was very comforting. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember the plot of Mary Had a Little Lamb. It doesn't involve slaughter, does it? Lamb chops. Lamb chops. 
which was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day, which was against the rule. <laughs> oh, they did laugh and play to see a lamb at school. They thought, holy shit, that's okay. <laughs> and I can tell you that kids do see in that language. <laughs> My daughter teaches third grade. And uh, when she gets back to school, she always forgets that you're not supposed to curse in third grade. <laughs> so he said, you know, well, where's my math book? I can't find my math book. What's that big ass green one right there? <laughs> no, actually, I'm sure she tries to curtail it after the first day. But my, my, my father sang to me, Old Man River. And I remember my father in law used to sing to the kids, I told every little star. Just how sweet I think you are. <laughs> Why haven't I told you? What a dee 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 dee. <laughs> so it's um, those, you know, a, 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 a song. Songs are the the songs are the closest thing to pristine poetry. Uh, that that go across um, whether you know the language or not, and they and they they transport. Uh, I remember up in Memphis. I mean, up in um, Indiana, where I live. We were talking earlier about uh, Amish, and there's a, a a Mennonite young woman that I had in class, and I said, "Do you remember, you know, the hymn and?" Uh, can you sing a little bit of it? And um, the, I mean, the lullaby. And what she remembered was this hymn. This kind of shaker like this hymn. And when she was singing it, her face just changed. And she kind of, you know, she was one of those young women that had the little, you know, see-through caps and and no, no makeup. You know, she had these pale eyelashes, and her face just all of a sudden just relaxed, and just she. And in that moment, she became beautiful. She was not a pretty girl. She became beautiful when she tilted her head and, and remembered. So see, that's very close to the that's very close to the heart. So that's what music means to me. Um, well, this this question is sort of a little different, um, but I was interested in um, some of your poems seem seem to um, exist for the reader as as um, you know. As, as, as a sensory experience as well as, 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 as um, uh, an emotional experience. And I just wanted to know, um, you know, how, how do you use uh, that, that sort of sensory language to relate with, uh, to the characters that, that you're using, that you're using for? And I mean, are, are there like, um, are there tested strategies that you use to do that for each poem? Are you talking about kind of the tactile? Um, because I mean, the tactile, you know, the sound and, and touch are the ones that, you know, that you know, babies can't even see when they're born. They have those wonky eyes, you know. <laughs> they say you should put you should put targets in the crib because they can see a target, you know, because they're. Uh, but but touch and sound are those really early primeval things. But but that doesn't really have to do with characters. Uh, I wonder, were you thinking of a certain poem? Because sometimes I do have characters, and then I don't know how to how to relate that with what you're talking about the sensory. I don't quite understand. I can't think of a specific quote that I think you're not right away. Oh. I can't really think of one either. Um, the coldest conversation. Oh, the oh, uh, yeah, honey. <laughs> um, yeah, that's. Uh, that's a that's a dramatic poem. I mean, it's it, it's a narrative in the sense that it has two characters, but it does not have a narrator. It's a completely different structure. Uh, so, uh, I'm trying to think of other examples of purely dramatic poetry, and I think of early Frost, Home Burial, for instance. Is he says, okay, 
he was at the top of the stairs, she was at the bottom. And then, in a Miami Montana, just like Shakespeare, the, the, uh, the drama unfolds. I've had students, and I, you often have, I've often had gifted students who are gifted in, in theater, sometimes, sometimes gravitate to poetry classes. Sometimes it's very shy people, and sometimes it's actors. <laughs> and not that they're, not those are diametric opposites, but uh, and it, it works perfectly as a play. Uh, but that, but the, for, to let the characters tell the story, to let the characters enact the story, is very different from having a narrative frame where, in, in other Frost poems, like such as After Apple Picking, we're aware of he's the one telling the story. When I was really a naive beginning reader, I didn't realize that the narrator and an author were two different things. So when they say Shakespeare says, well, no, I mean Shakespeare's the puppeteer. Uh, but you'll hear, oh, Shakespeare, you know, the bard says, and then it's delivered as a little piece of wisdom. So uh, the, the, I, I, I'm more interested in characters as dramatic vehicles because they're easier to pattern than I am in being a narrator. So that's why I strip away. I don't, and, and again, I use framing. I call it husbandry. And I actually dedicated that to my, my daughter's friends, Jennifer and Max Topherzer. And I sneaked around and found out what their wedding date was. So I could put that down because I wanted that to be in a pattern with the place where I put the poem you heard last night, if you were there, that John and Carrie so beautifully enacted, uh, performed as actors, uh, of uh, my parents' wedding day. And um, in the, this, this latest book, I have a little, kind of a little chunk of family tree where I, instead of just dedicating it to my children, I put the family tree who Who's, and I put my, my daughter's and her husband's marriage date. You know, born, you know, and then M, period, and put their wedding date. And that, so that connects then with Jennifer and Max's wedding date. And I have a, a poem about my own marriage called Bride, Wife, Widow, which is false. It should be Bride, Wife, Divorcee. <laughs> But the feeling is, is the same, bride, wife, widow, and it's essentially the same language at each stage only she feels differently about it. Uh, and that's stripping away context to get the pure expression, whether it's of a character, in which case the tech or the sensory is, is, is important to include, or if it's language disembodied from any speaker. Western wind and wilt thou blow, I mean that's said by anybody and everybody because it's about homesickness. Would that I were home again. Uh, it's, it's, it's what we used to call universal. And that's what lyric poetry is for, and yet you must find something to make it distinctive, or otherwise it's just cliche. So it's, it's all very complicated. That satisfy you? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about how uh, you, Ruth. me, visual arts, what sort of role they play in your composition process? Because you have a lot of poems that are that you couldn't read because they were so visual and you know woven into uh, into the space of the poem. And I was wondering, do you sort of see poems in terms of their structure first, or how does that impact your composition? No, I, um, I usually see poems as a form of play. I'm a big believer in in play because it, because it's authentic and it's desired. Uh, if if you're being forced to play, then it's not play. But uh, if you approach any situation as a game, now not everybody likes games. Some people absolutely abhor games. I had I had a teacher, Frank Bedard, who's a wonderful teacher, but hates games. And I was I was determined to include certain poems. He helped me with my first manuscript, and he said. I said, well, see, here's this this part comes down here, becomes this part. He said, he said, I hate games. Either explain it or don't include the poem because I can't read this. <laughs> uh, but that, you know, ultimately, so I immediately, that, I thought I actually bought it right at the time, but I since have included it because uh, that's part of what I do. Uh, and so uh, a, a, a structure, a structure for me is just always. And it has in common with painting, not with sculpture, but with but with but with drawing. Really, not even painting, drawing. It's that it's that marking on paper, that white surface, 
black marks. So, for instance, I just got a solicitation saying, do you have any poems that we could do in color? Well, no, not really. You know, because type, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, and you can get people say, oh, you should get this great application on your phone because it, you can do all kinds of painting stuff. I'm not interested in painting, I'm interested in typography and in making, uh, making areas of light and dark occur on the page with black and white only. I never, I never proceeded to color because that's too far from the graphic, the writing. I like, and in artists, I like their, 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 their drawings or sketches, like Rembrandt's sketches, because it puts you there. It's that immediacy. And, and that's the, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's, or Vermeer is one of my favorite paintings because you can feel, you can feel it. <laughs> then there, it's, there again, see, it's that sensory. It's tactile and it's kinetic. So that's, that's the area of visual arts that interests me and that's what I try to express in, in my poems that are, that, are, that are interested in art. And I'm also inter interested in art as a subject. Uh, in the arts poetic of the poem that says what a poem should be or in plastic writing, which is poems or any writing based on uh, plastic arts, visual arts. So, it's, and it's also a good chance to steal, since I can't write twice, as I've already confessed. Um, you can take a, something that's been frozen in, a, in one surface and, and animate it. What happened just before this photograph was taken? What happened outside the frame of this photograph? These are all just generative principles for me. Speculative principles. And so that's I, I begin there rather than rather than beginning with the idea of structure. I think structure is a much more sophisticated thing that it comes in at I don't know when. Uh, it it doesn't feel like a starting point to me. So sort of on that on that structure um, idea, when you said that um, you're interested in patterns and formal structures that's proliferative modes. Mm -hmm. Just tripping over the book. Um, are there any other ways that language can achieve this function, um, and is it ever problematic? Uh, yes, the problem with proliferation is that it, it is hard to stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, nu or as, like nuclear, as Bosch would say. Uh, nuclear. I remember Jimmy Carver saying, and I asked Amy what was on her mind, and she said, nuclear proliferation. I thought, I kind of doubt if Amy was 10 at the time. She <laughs> said, you know what, it's nuclear proliferation. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, but I am into, I, I'm using proliferative um, to mean a kind of a, a branching leafing structure that you, you, you set up, and it has to do with kinesis again, you set up the way something moves and so that theoretically it can be moved by another player or it, it, will, it can uh, repeat itself. So I'm interested, for instance, in, in poems that have multiple, uh, like the poem last night again, that could be read down or across, and where you get more bang for your buck. That's what I mean by proliferating, that you get more than one poem per page. Uh, because it doesn't necessarily start in the upper left-hand corner and go to the lower right-hand corner. It, uh, it aspires, like a drawing, to be unified in time, to be, to be perceptible in time as an instant, so that yes, then you can then read it, but on the other hand, it's got, it's got a life that, you know, it, it's, it suggests it's next. I have one, one poem whose entire text is, each into its next, each into its next, each into its next, each into its next, each, in, and it goes, I, I, I once had my son with a stamp kit, with an alphabet stamp kit, uh, put that on a piece of, um, uh, adding machine tape uh, that was left over from my dad's store, Mark Spears Clothing Company, Pawnee, Oklahoma, and go all the way around the room of where I was giving a reading. And, I, and, he, and he said, Mom, where does this end? And I said, it ends when you run out of paper. When they run out of tape, and so I think it ended on its, I mean, it didn't matter where it ended because you clearly could understand that it's a such simple thing, four words that you can, at any given moment, you can predict what's gonna happen next. Now, how, what does that say? That's not a story, and yet it's every story. 
Every story is serial. Every story is each into its next. Each action produces a counteraction. So it's that theory of proliferation that I'm interested in. And then there are certain experimental writers uh, who have been interested in it too, who tend to be math-minded people. Uh, I'm thinking there's a book called, uh, this book called A Thousand Thousand Sonnets. Mille uh, Mille, whatever, you know, in French. Uh, and it is a book that's got, uh, it's uh, 14, it's got, you open it and it's got strips. Every page has been cut into 14 strips. And so it's like those little figures that you know has an alligator head and a hippopotamus body and duck feet, where you only only uh, only uh, uh, gone to the extreme with 14 components and you know 100 pages or whatever it is, so that you can turn one strip and you have a certain sonnet. You can turn a handful of strips and you have another sonnet. It says that there is it says that there is not an authoritative sonnet. There is instead sonnet production. And reader, would you like to try? You're welcome to try. You're welcome to put together whatever sonnet you like. We don't say that there's any one that's better than any other. So what does that do to how you make a judgment? So if you judge it, that's that that's judge it succeed if the proliferative is what you're after. If the narrative is what you're after, it fails. So I consider the proliferative, a, you know, a, a mode as an alternative to the traditional ones, which are epic, drama, lyric, that the ones that we inherit, you know, from Aristotle's theories. Uh, that that this that this would not have been recognized as art in most times and places, but that it is a potential. And now with computers, they're just now I have students who are very interested in producing works using algorithms that come in computers. Yes. I have had, one of my students just wrote to me, he's had a chapbook coming out that, that used a computer program. There's a website called beardofbees.com or .org or whatever it is, Beard of Bees. Which has got a little logo of a man with only bees, his beard. It's really surrealistic. It's that kind of, that's, and those surrealist writers were interested in. in proliferative modes and sources of uh, art that were not per exactly personal, that came from some strata of, of existence that is not contained by an individual's birth to death, you know, life. We should be afraid of an algorithm that is able to be a proliferative um, formula for creating poems. It'd be like an infinite cycle of poems. That's exactly. <laughs> Robot. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yes, one of mine was uh, was using a robot program, and he was writing about Davy Crockett. Who, if you're if you're from around here, everyone everyone's late Davy Crockett. I don't know how that could be. <laughs> <laughs> everyone has a great great grandmother who was a Cherokee princess, and they're related to either David, uh, either Cronk, either Daniel Daniel Boone or David Davy Crockett. Anyway, this student of mine who's from Ohio, supposedly related to, and so he wrote this thing called Crockbot. <laughs> playing on crock pot and robot <laughs> and I you know I said that's just too silly of a title because it ended up being a very serious expressive work where he every single piece of language in there is from Davy Crockett you know wrote the story of his life so there's archaic language in there but what is just completely denatured and taken out of its original context and ends up expressing things that Josh my student Josh Diamond didn't know and couldn't know that it took the, the robot and Davy Crockett and Josh. It took all three. And uh, the Beard of Bees guy also did one based on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which ended up being very strange and very frightening. By, you know, he would have some algorithm where it puts together words and then you just keep hit, you know, you hit, 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 hit. And it gives you other combinations. And when you find something you like, then you claim that and put it down. But, and, and I would say, Eric, I think, you know, can, can you just, just, just can't come up with another word, just this one place, this word is just wrong. Can't do it. It's like an evolution of flood poetry. Yeah, yeah, but, it's, but it doesn't have, but it, uh, unlike Flarf, it, the, the ones that I'm talking, my students are interested in Flarf too, but it doesn't have that tongue in cheek, these particular pieces don't have that tongue in cheek uh, attitude. 
but yeah, but that's part of it too. So does that satisfy you about proliferation? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Um, let's see, I have this question about, about, well, some of your poems seem to, um, employ, um, opposites in, uh, in, um, opposite motifs you know, to, to create, like, a natural tension, and, um, and, and then, um, that, that sort of, um, develops, develops drama with the poem, and I just wanted to see if you could talk about maybe how you, how you, Go about that process. Yes. Opposition? Yeah. Uh, are you thinking of that red, blue, red, blue, red, blue? That's one yeah, of them, yeah, they vibrate. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I can tell you that my, I can tell you the exact moment when I became interested in the idea of opposition. Uh, because one of the teachers that, when I went through an MFA program, it was a long distance program that you could do. Uh, it was a low residential program that you could do from wherever you happen to live. Uh, uh, and one of the teachers there was a guy named Ken Rose. He's an old guy. Uh, I think he's probably retired by now. But anyway, he said, when you get to the end of the poem, and you know what you're going to say, say the opposite, which will be as true and more interesting. And so I always thought that was an interesting idea, that, that like the like the yin yang idea that that things contain their opposites that uh, uh, but then but then you quickly realize that uh, opposition is not a simple matter that what what is the opposite of girl boy what is the opposite you know what is the opposite of girl woman what is the opposite of girl kumquat I mean, there's uh, opposition is actually a very complicated idea and so I'm interested in, that's why in that poem, Red, Blue, Red, Blue, it, the, each line starts out with a clear opposition, but then dissolves. And some of the language starts, starts slipping. Some of, them, some of the lines don't. But it, it has opposites like, like Mars and Venus, the god of love and the god of, I mean, the you know, god of war and the god of love. Well, are love and war opposites? Make love, not war. That's what we said in my generation. <laughs> Um, so those, uh, that's, I find that a generative idea. And here's, for those of you who, who teach, uh, it, this is an interesting proliferative thing to do with creative writing, is um, you give somebody, you give, give students a, a text, and you say, over every word, put its opposite. Let's say, right away they say, well, what's the opposite of a? Uh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, well, what is the opposite of a? Uh? And someone will say, the? And uh, so, um, what's the opposite of of? Without? Or against? Or do you stay in the same part of speech? Usually people will stay in the same part of speech. And so that the sentences they will make will make grammatical sense, but they will be describing a world that does not exist, that is surreal. And none of them will be identical. Because the complex, because opposition is not, there's no simple, opposite to any thing. There are no, they're, they're, they're false dichotomies. Uh, but there's, but where there's wiggle room, and I, and, and I also am just interested in symmetry. We have symmetrical bodies. I'm interested in two. I'm interested in two. It just gets so complicated when you get to three. Uh, and uh, so uh, the trouble with two, like the trouble with proliferation, is it, it can become just what proliferation is problematic because it never stops, two becomes static. There's not some third thing to make it wobble, you know? There's, there's two things and they tend to come to rest. So, uh, that the ideas of, even the idea of two, let alone the idea of opposites, introduces, introduces possibilities for, for adding a third, for changing something up. Well, I noticed ideas of family occur frequently in your work, and Princess of Home that John and Carrie mm -hmm. did so eloquently. Um, I was wondering, how does family play a role in the creation of your work? And, well, and you have to just get them in the other room, for one thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
you think it's possible to have poetry that isn't, you know, that isn't so entrenched in our own personal histories and families? Well, how do you define family? How do you define family? <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to go to law school? <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, wow, that's huge. I mean, families are, um, you know, you just, they're just, there's really no getting away from the, the fact that you spend time with people that you didn't yourself pick. <laughs> but that were, but that were, I, 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 I kind of believe in a, I almost believe in a kind of a comic uh, justice, which is that you, you know, you, this idea that you attract the parents that will, that you need, you know, that you somehow, uh, that these things, that these things happen over a, a much larger scale. So that's why family, yeah, you have your mother, your father, your kids, or, you know, your, your nieces and nephews. Uh, but in my family, there's a lot of adopted people, for one thing. My brothers are adopted, and, you know, quite a few members of my family have been adopted. And um, so then, and then people form family-like units out of, out of affinity. One of the interesting things that you study in law is the nepotism laws. You know, nepotism means nephew. It means hiring your nephew, which uh, which the popes were always like promoting their nephews, which were usually their sons. It was kind of a euphemism. Uh, sometimes they would say, "Oh, that's his nephew." Uh huh. <laughs> you mean his housekeeper's son? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, they would be. Oh, lo and behold, they'd be cardinals at the age of 21 <laughs> because of nepotism. Uh, and uh, in, in, in government, of course, and not, not just the Catholic Church, obviously, but uh, when you study, you know, third degree of affinity or consanguinity, that's the nepotism law. You cannot hire somebody within the third degree of consanguinity, which means co-blood, or affinity, meaning connected by marriage. So a family is not a static thing or necessarily a small thing, but your one's own family, yeah, you, that's, there's, there's a lot of material there. Uh, but I would never, I would never be somebody who, I think there are two, two, two rules about writing. Write what you know, write what you don't know. <laughs> uh, that, that neither one is adequate to a lifetime. And neither one is even possible. Because what do you know? You, 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 you know something different after you finish the poem than you knew going in. And write what you don't know. How could you write it if you don't know it? I mean, we, things, like, things like memory and imagination, that's another dyad, which is like the yin-yang scene. What's important about that is not just the two discrete colors come together at a curved border, but that each has the seed of the other in it. So in a sea of one color, there'll be this dot of another, which is always potentially going to be overwhelmed or to overwhelm. Uh, but it exists in a, in a spiral, in a dynamic, whirling version that keeps it from just you know exploding. Uh, so memory and imagination are like that. Here's the memory color. It's got a little piece of imagination in it. If you still, you go to remember something, pretty soon you're gonna, it's not very long before you're gonna have to imagine it because you don't really remember it. So you try to imagine, and it's at that place where you try to, uh, where you come to that gap, that's where literature is born. Right at that ditch, right at that ditch of the ineffable of what can't be said. Uh, because you don't remember. And right at that point, you must imagine. And likewise, oh, you know, here's the color, imagination. You, you tell anybody, imagine life on the moon. They're gonna have to remember something. They're gonna have to remember some image, something they've heard. Um, they're gonna have to, you know, uh, the imagination is not strong enough to operate in the vacuum. It draws on memory. That's, 
Philip Roth was one of my very, very favorite writers. When he was asked, uh, you know, he wrote this book uh, in which he imagines that Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, the aviator, uh, was elected president, which could have happened, actually. It was, it was close to him. And he was a pretty big anti-Semite, Charles Lindbergh, that is not Philip Roth, although that's not cool. But anyway, uh, it's on the radio, people asked Philip Roth, uh, well, how could you how could you write about uh, Charles Lindbergh being president? He said, I, I just remembered what it was like when he was president. <laughs> <laughs> Not I imagined what it was like, but I remembered what it was like when Charles Lindbergh was president. Well, Charles Lindbergh was never president, but memory is how that book got written. So that's. Now I have completely forgotten this question. Is this question about proliferation by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I know that I actually understand that novels are as complicated. I do understand that. <laughs> uh, but, I, but it's my great pleasure to take the pieces of, and, and I love advising students when they're putting together a thesis. Uh, when they have a body of work, they have a bunch of poems, and uh, figuring out uh, the optimum order, or an optimum, I mean, there's, not, there's no one answer, there's no boiling point of water, which you can be sure you've got it right. You know, it's, it, it, and it's because it's, there's so much uh, complexity involved. Uh, I, I usually just, uh, I myself just just go to a piece of paper and play around with it, and then uh, and then it's another, it's a whole other creative process to put the book together. There, but there are people who write project books, and I have, I do have one project book which I haven't been able to publish called Inkstone, which is specifically a book of, of poems that are derived from pre-existing texts. Uh, it, it's uh, and it was, you know, it, it was, it's driven by one idea. Uh, but usually I just have a group of poems, and they cohere or not. Um, it, there are just so, so many little uh, coincidences that have to do with what ends up in a book and what doesn't. And I have a hard time publishing books. So, I mean, I didn't in the beginning, but I do now. So, um, so there'll be poems that are, you know, that are, that are written, you know, many years apart. But I just kind of had this idea that, that there are certain abiding interests that, that worrying about being yourself, worrying, I mean, I always tell them, the students are always afraid they're going to write a miscellany. It'll just be, a, I, mean, I wrote that poem 10 years ago, how can that possibly belong? It'll just be a miscellany, you know, selected poems, I mean, a group of poems, greatest hits, something like that, and it won't have it, it won't have the right coherence, but the truth is they don't have to worry about that. If you wrote, there's a, there's, you're, believe me, you are so limited that if you wrote the poem, it coheres with your other poems. <laughs> Everybody is that limited, I mean, for better or for worse. Hey. <laughs> um, so, uh, you just, I just kind of have to tell the students that just to think, think it's a matter of faith, that any poems that you put together in any order will be a book. But now that doesn't exhaust the possibilities of expression. The possibility, and, and then, you know, I often do use musical ideas too. Think of, I, I often compare to, to, the, to the idea of, uh, of movements uh, in a sonata or a symphony, and questions about do you write in sections, do you put it in sections, but uh, I generally have just a group of poems and then I decide if they go here. And a lot of that is finding the title. I another thing I like to do is find, is look at the cover. Uh, and I always ask my students, "Go bring me a cover." And so they get to go to the art museums of, in, in Indiana. We live close to the great art institute of Chicago, 
and the Indy Museum, the Lilly family has endowed the, the Indianapolis Museum of Art is pretty good too. And not to mention little private galleries, or your own work, or, or you know, various you know, online sources, whatever. And the students, you know, they're always surprised by that. But, they, but that, that helps the book to cohere for me. And then I'll actually sometimes, once I have a cover, uh, actually adjust poems to, to make that part of it. So having, a, having a, a piece in the book that is a table of contents that has got most, but not all, of the poems that are in that book, and in a different order, uh, is a way to inscribe process. It's a way to have more than one book. You could compose that book, and you might have to make up some poems to do it. You might have to leave out some poems, you'd have to imagine them in another order, but it means that you get two books for once. It's a, that's, <laughs> that, that's that proliferative idea. And I'm also just interested in indices, in anything that's got a, an alphabetical order, and things that have got a kind of a, a arbitrariness to it, but yet people will um, make sense of it. Uh, I, I'm interested in, the, in, in something that suggests randomness or suggests the lack of an author. I mean, if the poems are going to be in alphabetical order, anybody can order them. But I've got, I have a book that's in alphabetical order, which has long been in alphabetical order, and then Mary Jo Bang, damn it, she didn't write a book that way, so now I can't do it, and it looks like a copycat murder. <laughs> uh, so I've got mine now in reverse alphabetical order. Which, uh, this, this is another one of the books I can't publish, it's called The Distaff Side. But in any case, um, it's, uh, I've changed the titles of poems because I actually secretly want them to be read in a certain order. So I would rather change the title. I don't believe that there's a, a right title, an inevitable title. And I'll change it so that it'll come at the right place. So I've monkeyed around with the titles of those poems so that I can have my cake and eat it too. I can have the order I want, but it'll look like the illusion will be, oh, she just put these in the out reverse out of the order. <laughs> so, uh, but putting together the collection, though, is a whole separate kind of creativity as opposed to writing single poems. Equally as important <coughs> and equally as fun and exciting. Yeah. You seem to also sort of be su suggesting with the table of contents that you sort of want the reader to have the authority to yes. reorder it. Right, fine. As Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's not quite a reader response theory, but it is the idea that the reader and the writer collaborate. <coughs> it's a different idea from the author, the authorial, the one and only inspired genius model, and instead says that it's participation that produces literature. That's not to say that any word can mean anything. And sometimes young poets will want to say, well, I want it to be ambiguous. And I always try to get them to understand that ambiguity is like cholesterol. There's good, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. <laughs> And there's good ambiguity and there's bad ambiguity. And you know, learning the difference between those two, learning when you want there to be multiple levels, which you do, but, but that it can't be anything. Because words inherently denote. I can't say mint, and I mean zinnia, if I want to say something about either of them. And so to say, well, I want to read, I want to say flower, because I want the reader to be able to see any flower they want. Uh, you can say something that way, but you can't say the same thing that you can say when you name the flower. So uh, I like to compare words to um, hailstones, or that they, they, they have a certain meaning, and then they go up in the air, and they get condensation on where it is. They come back down, they go past, up and down, up and down. Words acquire, uh, con, you know, con perpetually melting and freezing uses, usages of it. And so the word itself has a history. The word itself is, is both abstract and in that way ambiguous. But it also, but, but there's a limit. To, and I want students to be able to have a choice. So to say, do you want uh, you know, a, a moon that's fuzzy around the edges, or do you want a clear moon? Both are good, but you have to be aware of which you're choosing so that you control the degree of ambiguity. 
Not that it doesn't always there, but just the but but it's just a naive idea that some students have that I want my poem to I want I want my poem to mean whatever the reader wants it to mean. I got nothing to say. Yeah, you'll be writing poems until you're about twenty-one in two months. <laughs> uh, so. Um. Well, what's your initial? Huh? Where's your initial on there? Uh, right there. Okay. Right there. <laughs> if people need to go, I you know I can just talk endlessly about these things. We need to. This is great. We can. Yeah, why don't we do one more formal question the, and then we'll take questions from people. Well. Um, yeah, we've we'll uh, talked we a little bit. Uh, um, we've been talking about music a lot uh, here, um, and I was uh, particularly interested in, in your poem, Harvest, um, from the Town of Fire, that, uh, that uses the uh, found ballad. That's another found poem, yeah. And um, I, I really like that one, and I was interested to know if, um, if, you, if you seek out um, um, Historical texts or, or oral histories and, and that kind of thing, and, um, and and how you might go about if if you do that, how you might go about um, a, approaching a composition and, and maybe narrative. But yeah, that. yeah. Harvest is unlike the boy's will that he left. Harvest is the text is entirely, entirely found in another book, uh, in a book of prose, in a book about uh, Richard Stein. And uh, it's about Mildred Aldrich, who was a friend of hers. And the, the writing of the biography by a woman named Diana Suhami is the name of the author. Uh, it, was, it was that image, it, she was right, it was an image driven passage. And uh, so I just started doing the musical thing of counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. The bow meter, hymn meter, you know. Emily Dickinson, Yellow Rose of Texas. It's a. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. It's a very, you know, it's a very ancient, danceable meter. And so, uh, and because the language was already so full of imagery and figurative language, that it just seemed to be waiting to become a poem. So, uh, uh, <coughs> my, entire, my entire project was simply to pick a name for it, Harvest. It was all about the, it was all about the, you know, the, the plant life, but it was written but it, the book that she had written was a, was about World War II. I mean, World War I. And so it's this, um, uh, she had seen this battle and the old trope about a battle being at harvest, where people are cut down. Uh, and so I, I write it as a kind of a, as if to say that art can be complicit with violence. War can be made beautiful. A lot of artists have been interested in doing that. And uh, it's, um, it's, it's so that it is, you know, to, to write is, is, is it can, can be a very fraught thing to do. And then I cynically at the end point out how, you know, she made so much money off it. It was a very popular book. It went into 14 printings. So, uh, that's a poem I have a lot. I have you know, ambiguous feelings about that poem, uh, and I, you know, it, it has a little note that says where exactly where it comes from, because it wants to go back and find it. But on the on the larger question, do I have old documents and collect documents and have I, I, the answer to that is yes, because the documents that I have now are my mother's letters, diaries, and poems. Those are now my found texts, and I'm trying to write about that. Mary, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. <laughs>
stay yeah. type thing. And, See, uh, that's what I mean by participation. Right. Yeah. And this is, this is one of those. I think I haven't seen this. Yeah. <laughs> that I'm not standing by her, but I just thought it was just interesting. Even with your, you talk about your pictological or how you uh, place your poems and yeah. how, how it's visual. Um, this, as you said, looked like, I know I read one of your interviews, it's just like a quilt or the stitches. I mean, it could be so many things, very visual. Yeah. Uh, with the art, uh, the patterns, I mean, it's very visual, but I really like this form. And I also like the, the, um, Queen of Hearts. I love how you did that Queen of Hearts, and you place it in the form of having a mirror. Or I don't know if you did it in Wait a minute, which one? Oh, yeah, the Queen of Heaven? Heaven. Okay, the Queen of Hearts. Excuse me, Queen of Yes. Queen of Yeah. But I like how you place that. Uh, I don't know if you did you intentionally try to do the mirrors. The mirrors? Uh, yeah, well, I was kind of trying to make it look like a rose tree a little bit. Okay. Uh, this one's got gaps in it. Mm -hmm. That that one's mm -hmm. kind of an interesting yeah, genesis. This, this the yeah, see, it looks like that. Yeah. And um, originally it didn't have the, the trunk. It was, it just had the, it had the gaps always, but, uh, and, uh, Another another case like you bring scatting to that other poem. Uh, my daughter looked at this poem, this Queen of Heaven. She said, "I see the Trinity." Mom, did you mean that? Oh. No, but I will. But I'll take it. You know, I'll, I I don't claim it as author, but I include it as as <coughs> poem. See what I mean? Right. And uh, so uh, the and those are also well, those are both two you know strikingly visual poems. And I would have read uh, they, they vibrate, which goes. Red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, Venus bar, blah, blah, blah. If I had been able to project it, I, I was able to give a reading one time where that poem was projected uh, behind me as the whole time I was reading with, you know, with a right. PowerPoint thing. And so then when I read it, people could look at it and follow it. it and it, it goes like this, like a, almost like a, like a chart that marks a heartbeat, like this. Uh, and so, uh, but it's read different ways. I mean, that, that was published in a magazine. And the the editors, when they read it, they told me later at the uh, at the meeting where they were deciding whether to take the poem or not, uh, two people read it in tandem, so that oh. one would say red, the other would say blue. And they said it turned into a fight, like each one would say, and I kind of meant that to be included, like the Mars and the Venus one, you know, like you keep insisting, like war, love, war, you know, like you. They said, she said they kept saying there's louder and louder, like, let me win this. So that, you know, is creating this artificial uh, combat between two supposedly opposite things. Uh, so what I like, you know, that I, I'm very fond of that poem because it's, uh, because everybody, everybody does, it's a little bit of a Rorschach. People go, oh, say, oh, that's obviously a rabbit. What? <laughs> I guess it has his ears, you know. <coughs> Oh, that's obviously that's obviously a skull that's been smashed on the highway. Oh, okay. Well, let's put this person in jail. <laughs> uh, <coughs> because that's that goes that that actually ties together all of my answers to all of these questions uh, in the in those two poems. And Queen of Heaven, I like because Queen of Heaven is a is a it could be a sentimental poem. It's about my grandmother and about the name that I got. But then the trunk of it is a found text. I used as the trunk of it, I came across a document that had all this stuff from my mother that I've been schlepping around years and years and years. I have many file boxes of my mother's stuff. She died with a house full of stuff. She never went, never threw anything away. And it's all this stuff. And I found, uh, of course, many you know, prayer books and Catholic stuff, uh, and uh, including the litany to the Virgin Mary, which, you know, Mary the, Mary the Great, Mary the Vine, Mary the this. And in, in, in the Catholic Church, it would be the praying would be, you know, marry the so and so. The the leader would say that, and then the congregation would say, pray for us. Da 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 da. Pray for us. You know. And so they, all these little names that are attached, and there, there's there's litanies to different uh, saints and different. Uh, because my name is Mary, though I picked that one, and so then I used that as the trunk, picked the ones I liked, and ordered them the way I wanted. I didn't cut it out of the prayer book. But I kept that, you know, that sense of what it was doing, and I wasn't really happy with that poem until, until that part got attached. Yeah, thank you. But that's also a play. You, you see, that's I just want to impress on you more than anything else. Homo ludens, you know, the creature who plays. I think that's very. Uh, that will get you through.
And scatting is like that. I mean, scatting is, is playing because it's improvised right. to an extent. And yet it, it refers to other scatting occasions. And it, it, so it's, it, uh, it, it's, got, it, it's a genre, but yet it includes improvisation. Those, that seems to me a very deep paradigm for how poetry works. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You have a lot of references to textile arts and, and what you were talking about and what you say your poems. Do you do that? Um, do you do, um, do I do textiles myself? Yeah. Yes. And, and lo looms weaving? I never weave. I've never woved. <laughs> uh, I don't actually know how to weave. I've got that on my list of things to learn. I would like to be able to weave. Uh -huh. um, but. Um, but the embroidery. Well, I do embroidery, but you know, embroidery is tedious. Um, and and so I, uh, I, but I do, I do various forms. Uh, I like. I made my son a huge uh, knitted blanket with just the plain stitch. It took me five years to make it. I've been working on it the whole time. It's, it's really, it's really long and really heavy, and it's it's made out of two different yarns. One is pure silk. And another is kind of the velour kind of yarn, and so there there are two shades of red that are not quite the same. And so sometimes one will be uppermost, and sometimes the other. So it makes it kind of a corrugated. It makes it, you know, it's a corrugated surface, but it's also kind of shimmers. Uh, and so uh, and that I really feel that connects me with you know with my ancestors. My own mother had nothing good to say. I had to go to my aunt, her enemies, in order to learn how to. Do needlework because my mother was disdainful, as many women in the 1950s who were all of a sudden decided to, you know, were disdainful of household work. My mother hate. I've got a little poem I wrote when I was a child saying, "Pots and pans, pots and pans. Mommy hates them, but I like them." <laughs> and it was the, it was a it was on a little a little postcard of copper. Copper was all the thing in the 1950s. Like everyone wanted. Copper uh, hardware on kitchen cupboards and things like that, and the copper copper plates and stuff like that. Uh, so, but my mother hated sewing. But I, I, I just you know, and it's it's also again, it's just something I'm good at. I learned to do it as a child. I've done it all my life, off and on. Made all you know, children's clothes, my daughter's prom dresses, wedding dress. All you know, it's um, I I just love to do these things. And now I'm making, my current project is this great 24 by 24, uh, the, most of them are quilts, some of them are embroidered, but they're pillow covers. Because my daughter bought a sofa and she hated the brown and wine sofa cushions that came, the pillows that came on it, and she was going to throw them away. I said, wait a minute, I can, you know. So I make these things and they, uh, they, uh, they're one side will be plain, one side will be fancy. Anyway, I've made about 30 of them. And they're square. I, I'm thinking about using one for a book cover, actually. Wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of applique, also, and some quilting. She just had me make a. She wanted it to be a wonky Lincoln's log cabin thing. So instead of straight lines, you just cut pieces that are more or less rectangular, but they're like parallelograms and so on. It just turned out fabulous. It makes all the rest of them look really dull. But she buys the fabrics, and so and then I sit in her house and and I make them at her house because if I make them at my house, they get cat fur on them, and then her husband's like cats. So I make them at her house, and it's things that you can have, carry on a conversation. Yeah. So I, I absolutely, and you know I I resent it when people. I just had a student who just was explaining the word oral in a Charles Wright poem. Saying, oh, it's the word whorl. It has all these meanings, which it does, one of which had to do with a spindle. Which, and he said, and a whorl also has to do with spinning and weaving. He said, wait just a minute. Spindles are not used in weaving, you idiot. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I told him once already, I said, not weaving, spinning. Yes, spinning. And then he sent me the revised version, and it still has got weaving in there. So I went out there in green ink. I don't want to use red. Green ink. As I said <laughs> before, you idiot. <laughs> and I, I was very happy with the poem one time where I was able to use the term flat fell. The flat fell is seen. 
that was an infected phone call, girl, it's sewing machine. And so I consider this, I'm kind of territorial about fabric arts. I consider them, you know, I don't like people to just refer to them metaphorically, oh, it's a quilt, but they don't know anything about quilting. Because <laughs> uh, I, I consider it an area of expertise. And, it, and, and, and you think about the, like the quilt at G's Bend, for instance, the way that they, you know, the way that they use the denim, the overalls, I mean, that's, uh, and it's something I share with my daughter. She's very interested in visual arts. So. Yeah. Well, these these square pillow things are great. They all have black, uh, you know, quilt binding tape around the edges, and they snap together. And they're always coming unsnapped. So they're not only pillow covers; they're an activity. <laughs> <laughs> snaps, snaps. They've got nine snaps. Uh, and I've got some magnet boards that are 24 by 24, and I wanted to like make a gallery in the hall. Uh, and, you, and, my, and my daughter said, I don't know how I feel about that, Mom. Because yeah. she has them all in her closet, and she's got them with little clothespins, and then she's got a corner up here, so it makes it diagonal, so she can see what's on both sides and choose which one she wants to put out. So I don't think she's going to let me have it for that. But I think I can use one for the book cover. So we look forward to that book. Yeah. yeah. Mary, thank you so much. Thank you.